Hello and good afternoon from Singapore. Welcome to the first of two live segments of the Singapore Biennale's online symposium. We are grateful to all our speakers for their patience as we adapted the symposium to an online format in the wake of COVID-19. We are also glad for this opportunity to extend the reach of the Biennale Symposium beyond our shores and hope you will get comfortable wherever you are and stay with us for an afternoon of sharing and discussions. So the Singapore Biennale is organized by the Singapore Art Museum with the support of the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth and the National Arts Councils of Singapore. The 2019 Biennale is helmed by Artistic Director Patrick Flores with curators Andrea Pham, Rena Naruan, John Tung, Go Ying, who will moderate our second live segment, Anka Meule, and Vipash Purichanant. Title Every Step in the Right Direction, the title, quoting Patrick, is all at once a proposition, an argument, and a call for all to be in the world today and to do what is right for it. It is from this title, with its premise, that as the world makes art, so does the art make the world, that the symposium program and today's panels have been developed. So the program for today is as follows. Our first panel runs till 4 p.m. Singapore time. And the second panel, um, sorry, and the second panel follows from there till 6 p.m. Singapore time. These panels are not the only components of the symposium. Transcripts and recordings of Patrick Flores' opening remarks, um, Lapita, or Michel Dizon's keynote lecture, Jalal Tofik's explication of his concept of radical closure are all available on the Singapore Biennale website um, that you see there, um, singaporebiennale.org slash symposium, as will the recordings of these panel discussions after today. So um, for our first panel, we are delighted to have with us four eminent speakers um, Moses Serebiri, writer and curator whose cur curatorial projects include Greater New York 2020, MoMA PS1 Survey of Contemporary Art, and the 10th Berlin Biennale. We have Miyu, who lectures at the Ac Academy of Media Arts Cologne and Alto University Helsinki, and with Bina Choi, co steers the re research curatorial project Unmapping Eurasia. Francesca Zolium, art historian, curator, and the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art Leipzig who curated the German Pavilion in Venice in 2019, and Bart de curator of director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Antwerp, who also curated Documenta 9 and the 6th Moscow Biennale. So um, this panel is titled The Geopoietic and the, Tech and the Ethical, to encapsulate the Biennale's prompt to reworld through form and to inspire thoughtful sympathy for urgent action. The panel asks of its speakers to engage with the range of concerns on how places or spaces give rise to specific propositions for the project of transformation. Central here is the analysis of power and its organization of social formation, as well as how sensible form can disrupt and resist this hegemonic rhythm. With this as our starting point, some aspects of the discussion uh, might then include the instrumentalization of art, decentralized practices, collective action, historical restitution and legacies of control, and borders and circulations. So we've been allotted two hours for our panel, and the plan is for each speaker um, to present for about 15 minutes, followed by a discussion and a Q&A with our live audience. Um, before I hand over to our first speaker, I'd like to pick up on the last part of the panel's description. Actually, this is an earlier version of it, where the word rhythm is mentioned, of how sensible form can stand or hold its own in the rise and flows of power. Rhythm, I would argue, provides a more accurate representation of the dynamism that might be said to characterize both potentiality as well as the sensible. And the basis of rhythm is time. And the two, time and rhythm, can be noted as occurring with particular effect within the artworks of the Singapore Biennale. And I'd like to call attention to a few of these. Sharon Shin, in the skin of a tiger monument to what we want to go kita, which involved two events before the exhibition, which gathered 200 participants in Singapore and Malaysia to sit and think about the artworks proposition of what 
those who assembled wanted, and to perform the act of sowing in a recognition of the necessity of action in the achievement of desires and hopes. Far, the Batambang Circus from Cambodia, um, Pumsta. Firstly, the physical and technical precision or timing required in live acrobatics. Uh, some of the acts performed were, in fact, quite harrowing to watch up close. The timing of one's breath followed the exertions of the performers as they spun, jumped, flipped, and somersaulted with uncanny ease, as well as the play on historical time and the performance's narrative of modernity and its values and effects in the present. Um, Papon Sok Lahore from Thailand, far with the artwork Far From Home Meeting Place, a work that recalls the travel journal of King Chula Long Khan from 1907 and its photographs of European landscapes, transposed on the subject of those displaced for political reasons. Time here is a feeling of nostalgia, a sense of dislocation and a loss that grows or ebbs over time. Central uh, audiovisual Max style Timor Leste archive um, of the immediacy of the documentary footage of the 1991 Santa Cruz massacre and the archive as a reminder of petrol, perpetual return to recall and not forget the sacrifices of the time, not to mention the time it might take to heal from violent past and incident. And finally, Amanda Heng's Every Step Counts, presenting time in its durational and felt or somatic sense where actions are not divorced from time. What I wish to introduce um, to the panel, and perhaps we can return to this in the discussion, is thus this aspect of time and timing in relation to action and by extension, the ethical. Certainly there are urgencies and urgency as urgencies are inherently about time. And I'd like to then surface two important states of positions in relation to time with reference to the work of the philosopher Alan Badu. First of, of waiting. In Badeau's opus, Being an Event, which was also a play on Martin Heidegger's Being, Being and Time, Badeau refers to the patient watchman of the void. I paraphrase. A patient watchman of the void who is instructed by the event within which to construct the means to sound, if only for an instance, the sight of the unpresentable. Second, of the, of the obverse, of not waiting referring to Jacques Lacan's prisoner's dilemma in logical time and assertion of anticipated uncertainty, Badeau suggests that it is haste that produces the subject, where in a combination of courage and confidence, the subject broaches the conditions of limitations and emerges. The dilemma is undone not because of a shrewd calculation of odds, but because it is no longer worth doing anything else. The point is that these two positions are in fact not contradictory, waiting and haste rather by Badu and they work in tandem. That is, one waits and watches for the moment to, in order to, in haste, capture or emerge from it to great effect, or in short, where, and this can be further debated, timing is everything. And with this, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Moses Seribiri. Thank you. Thank you so much, June. Um, that is a, a fantastic uh, opening. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Hopefully. Um, I am a soft speaker, so. <laughs> um, so uh, I will be speaking on um, the uh, idea and uh, concept of, of death. Um, obviously, uh, this has been a topic that has been explored before, notably by, you know, uh, various philosophers. Um, but for me, um, it is a topic that speaks directly to Uganda um, in the 1940s, uh, specifically with one artwork um, called uh, Death. And so that is my departure point um, for this uh, presentation. Um, these reflections are in dialogue with and alongside the work of curator and artist Gabin Mobo artist Emma Uluka Wanambwa and the members of the School of Anxiety, artists and writers Nyakalo Maleke, Sanyu Chimba Chisaka, Awar Onyango, and myself. Um, death is conceptualized here as an artwork and via the African literary modern, which 
as we all understand, um, uh, particularly speaks to um, black literature, black and African literature in the early 20th century. Um, death is also, um, for me, a, premon a premonitory sign of later debates that happened involving African history, um, particularly during the 1980s. And such debates include um, the end of history, the end of the university as we know it, the end of history, um, that was Francis Fukuyama, and the end of decolonization, um, also the end of the left, the final defeat of the left. And um, I propose in this um, presentation that death as, as an artwork uh, foretells, even though it is made in the 1940s, uh, some of these larger debates that happen much later. Um, in a conceptual reading of death, um, I will share my screen at this moment. Um, this artwork, um, which was completed in the 1940s, um, was produced under the Makere Art School, where Gregory Malova, the artist um, in, and its author, um, made trips to the medical school um, at the Makere University Training Hospital, um, where World War II soldiers returning from uh, the war, African soldiers in particular, were admitted for treatment. Um, while the social aspects of this artwork would be later sanitized in subsequent readings um, that emphasized, you know, the material itself, um, the work really emphasized the idea of the nation and in a way um, decided and focused on nationalism. Um, death, which was a translation of the mythical angel of death, Walumbe, um, who is squeezing you know, a man with his bare hands was a premonition, I understand it as a premonition on the shift of institutional systems. Um, here we speak, of course, of um, shifts taking place um, from the uh, colonial to the post-colonial, um, but also I think of it as, um, you know, kind of a premonition of what Fanon may have called the end of the colonial enterprise. Um, Salah Hassan, the historian, uh, lets us uh, in on the idea or the fact that the African modern is um, appears nationalistic. And so um, that, that artwork itself and much of the work that was made at the time within that uh, context of the African modern, um, we recognize the nation as a dominant thread weaving through these works. Um, I want to talk about the fact that for me, death is not necessarily a work that um, is um, purely formalist <laughs> or purely aesthetic. I think death is a riddle and a linguistic act um, as much as it is a kind of uh, formalist uh, uh, structure and so I also think of it as bringing together the nationalistic and in a sense the philosophical and I use the work um, uh, in this context of this uh, talk to create a kind of speculative reading of history through um, this specific perspective of, of quote, mythical death. Um, and so I'm just going back to sort of share my screen again. Um, and so, one second. Okay, so the, um, the idea um, of KANU, which is the Kenyan African National Union, 
um, is a post-colonial organization that was established in the 1950s to protest white colonial uh, Kenyan government. Um, and what we are seeing here in this picture is a monument that was made to in a, in a way, historicize itself, but many have understood this monument to actually be, the monument is called the Nyayo Monument, but many have understood this monument to actually be uh, an attempt to historicize one person, i.e. Uh, President Moy. And, um, and so in the weeks since, um, the, the, the monument was built in 1988, but in the weeks since President Arab Moy's unexpected death, which uh, has only occurred in the last few weeks, um, various opinions have been published that have pointed out um, this monument, especially and Uhuru Park itself, and the events of the 1990s. Um, part of those events are the hunger strike that was staged in the park, to protest um, the detainment of political prisoners, and so um, and so, uh, you know, going back to this idea of of, of death as um, as in a way a conceptual um, framework or a conceptual paradigm um, to read, you know, these larger sort of moments occurring further along in the timeline of post-colonial history. Um, I, I want to think of the ghost of Moy that is haunting the public at this juncture in time, but I also want to understand that these, these monuments are sort of like uh, present as, you know, um, as these, uh, how do you call them, as these uh, representations of not only a nation but a person as well you know so um, the the opinion it's okay um, the the opinion um, I mean um, but how many how may we use uh, death again you know as an ontological device to produce a speculative reading of history you know so my death be indeed the premonitory sign of Moy's fall from grace in the 1990s and, and did the hunger strike of, of 1992 by Monica Wangu Wamwere and others who threw off their clothes in Uhuru Park um, in Gikuyu with uh, with say Kuturango, um, in defiance of authorities, you know, um, is death a premonitory sign of the unleashing of evil that sent Walumbe, the angel of death, to Moi's person, whose presidency um, began to began its ultimate downfall after that, really, and ended in two thousand two. Um, I want to sort of uh, provide. Um, provide this as a kind of speculative reading, of course, of history. Um, the fantasy projects by Kanu and others, you know, um, and by fantasy, I sort of mean really um, how we understand the, the attempt by post-colonial governments to, uh, to provide, to, um, to take the place, I should say, of, of, of post-colonial regimes to take the place of the colonizer. Um, and as Audre Lorde would say, um, well, as Fanon actually would say, you know, to, to take over the master's house. And so in a way, I think of the fantasy um, being played out in Uhuru Park, in Nyeo House, in the Nyeo Monument, um, and by Moy as a kind of... Um, the process that is happening in the post-colonial realm, but also in a psychoanalytical realm, in a way. Um, shall we argue that, <laughs> that the park's alternative history symbolized by the trees planted there during the 1992 protest and hunger strike by the National Council of Kenyan Women is a testament to institutional shift 
um, shall we argue that uh, the fantasy of post-colonial leaders to take over the house of a colonizer, um, you know, fulfills this uh, statement by Adre Lord that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And, uh, and so just going back here to, um, now, um, hold on. I think I'm still sharing my, wait, I'm not sharing my screen. Let me share my screen again. Um, so I will share my screen again to, to go to a different example, uh, which is, uh, in, in South Africa, um, in present day South Africa. So uh, just considering um, uh, Rhodes University and, and Cecil Rhodes, um, a prominent figure of British imperial history, um, what might we tell about the state of the university. After all, uh, Fukuyama declared that history would end and in a way that the university itself as we know it, right, as one of the basis of, of modernism, that it would, you know, collapse, right? Uh, and so um, in South Africa, I think um, I'm interested in trying to understand how the institutional shifts uh, predicted by Gregory Malova's artwork, Death, uh, are useful in the case of understanding negated subjectivities as arbiters in contemporary subject formation within the university, how are subjects formed inside of the university. And so um, for me, the, the idea um, that that keeps recurring is this idea of the African University, um, notably recently Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, the Ugandan um, uh, anthropologist, has written an essay called The African University in uh, the London Review of Books that, that, you know, tries to put things in context. It analyzes the intellectual history of various humanities departments since independence in the 1950s. And it questions whether the African university is an oxymoron. Um, and so this is where the, 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 the roads must fall, which is the movement that students uh, started a protest movement. Um, to take down and to quote decolonize the university um, can be placed in context. Um, so the first place for me would be to try and and analyze how institutional shift has been foretold by Dev um, by looking at certain these kinds of, of of gestures that are taking place in the present day. Um, the end of history. Um, also would imply the defeat of the left, according to Fukuyama, and uh, leftist movements uh, in South Africa opposed apartheid vigorously. Black consciousness movements, South African jazz movements. Um, and at the same time, you know, while Malova signaled the end of the Second World War, um, which was also in some ways the birth of uh, the independence you know, real uh, agitation and, and, and real uh, signs of, of, of independence in Africa, um, it would lead to sort of broad shifts, uh, uh, broad shifts which would prevail through largely unforeseen, I'm saying unforeseen vital forces. And uh, so uh, in a speculative history, <laughs> Uh, in which we look at South African music as part of the left, um, we follow that, um, you know, the figures Miriam, Man Miriam Makeba, Hugh Masekela, Moses Molelekwa, uh, and Steve Biko, um, so-called uh, are dead, right? That they, that that they are dead and therefore um, that kind of history has been covered. But at the same time, in a speculative history, the left did not die, as Fukuyama had declared, but was reborn in various global consciousness, political and artistic movements today. From um, the 
music that young South Africans are, are, are making today, Qom, uh, to the fullest movement that took down the Cecil Rhodes statue, to Afrobeat, to Afropunk, and to Black Lives Matter. And so, um, how then should we rethink institutional shift, you know, um, in lieu of death, um, the artwork as an ontological device? Um, if we consider Achille Mbembe's proposition in his book, um, De la Postcolonie, or On the Postcolony, um, that marker of institutional shift is shit. It is the scatological and the vulgar signaled in the symbolic act of throwing shit onto a monumental sculpture of Cecil Rhodes. And um, this gesture, um, which actually took place um, at the Rhodes University, um, was accompanied by the stern warning, we are not done yet. I should share that. Let me share um, that um, poster as it was um, um, if you can see um, this uh, poster we are not we are not done yet and so um, uh, the considering Chantal Mouffe's uh, notion of the defeat of the enemy really um, when considering Another sort of speculative, well, um, just the defeat of the enemy in regards to um, the enemy that uh, apparently was the left, the enemy that apparently was black consciousness, the enemy that um, has been um, um, black music in South Africa. Um, the, uh, the novelist uh, Maris Condé, um, also gives us a few pointers when looking directly at South Africa. In her novel, uh, L'Histoire du Femme Cannibale, the story of the cannibal woman. And uh, the, the novel is set in, in between Cape Town and other geographic locations around the world. And is a reading of the post-colonial, in a sense, a reading of suppression of vital forces, such as anger and what happens when forces are negated. And so in a premonitory statement in the novel, not dissimilar from uh, Gregory Malova's sculpture from the 1940s, uh, death, a character declares that because of the unresolved tension in South Africa, the unvoiced anger and trauma and pain that characterized uh, institutional shifts in the country, notably when Nelson Mandela was elected president, that one day we would wake up to a bloodbath and that the vital forces would be unleashed like a curse all over again, all over um, South Africa. And, um, and so uh, my presentation has been really trying to uh, uh, think about uh, a work that was made in the 40s, but to also think about Gregory Malova's practice um, as, uh, in a way, as an ontological device, but also as a framework in how we might understand um, these various moments in history, in post-colonial history, but also <laughs> in the ways in which curses, uh, you know, are born where we did not see them, uh, in ways in which the death of a president in Kenya um, brings back stories of protest from the 90s in media today being reported right now, and makes us wonder whether trees uh, the planting of trees really signals any kind of institutional shifts uh, in the sense bringing back Audre Lorde's statement that the master's house, uh, the master's tools will, will never dismantle um, the master's house. So um, thank you very much. I might ask Francisca if you might be ready to yes. present. Yes. Okay, all yours, Francisca. The introduction and for the invitation. I'm actually not only thrilled, but now by now awake. <laughs> and um, and in case that uh, my images disrupt the sounds, uh, please feel free to display them uh, from your computer. I forwarded it to to you. What do you um, okay. I would like to um, talk about the work. Um, I collaboratively did with uh, Natasha Zathagigian 
an artist space in Berlin, among other places, and together with a huge range of um, other collaborators, other artists and musicians and theorists. In uh, the end of 2017, I was uh, commissioned by the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs to curate the German pavilion in 2019. And it is quite particular in Germany that it's not the Ministry of Culture, but the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who runs, um, the, who, who takes care of the presentation, artistic presentation at the Venice Biennial, this uh, more than 100 years old institution, um, uh, one of the oldest or the oldest European um, biennial. And um, the presentation, is followed and accompanied by a huge public um, uh, interest. So uh, while we walk, uh, while we worked on the artistic project, there have been a lot of um, inquiries about who would present uh, at the German Pavilion and what would be the presentation about. So you need to imagine that you have one year to develop a project and um, while you work uh, people constantly ask you questions of who is going to participate and what the contribution will be about and it's quite um, yeah uh, tiresome to uh, to play this uh, hiding game for for one year well finally um, after we had started to work together in uh, February 2018 we um, um, we organized the first public event. Can you see the image? Yes. Um, so what you see here is the um, first public event of the artistic project that we uh, developed together. And in the very beginning, as we understood that this framework of uh, commission by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in this hugely representative context of the Venice Biennial, where you have 19 nations who present uh, artworks by contemporary artists, um, that we wanted to, uh, to turn this context, this very context also, into one part of the artistic work. Um, so all public parts of the projects be considered part of the artwork. Um, what you see here is the press conference at the Zeughaus Kino, uh, former repository for arms in Berlin, where now you have the Museum of German History and uh, also this Zeughaus Kino, which is a cinema. And uh, what you see here is the panel of, for the presentation of the artistic production, um, it, who is the second person from the, from the right. And what you also see is that um, it's not me introducing the artistic position, but um, the person sitting next to me, so the second person from the left, the spokeswoman of the artistic position, Helene Duldung. So we wanted to trigger all these questions. Um, who does have a voice? Who does speak? And who is heard in uh, such, um, um, such contexts? And um, what you also see is that uh, the artistic position bears a kind of a mask, um, a stone head, which also kind of irritated, but joyfully and playfully opened up the, the field for, for, the, for the further development of this project. And to be honest, it was um, quite interesting to sit close to a stone so um, you, I kind of constantly worried that the stone would just roll from, from the top of her uh, shoulders. So it's a very, um, very smooth and poetic irritation, as I find, that does not allow for, um, you know, like um, definite categories of uh, human being, non-human being, of uh, um, a lively existence or a non-lively existence, uh, but it doesn't um, it doesn't allow either for definitions or categories such as uh, female or male, 
artists or non-artists. So um, um, this shift of uh, creating this mask was very much about to, to open a much broader field than you would expect in this uh, specta spectacle of the biennial. And for the purpose of her presentation, the artist even adapted her name. In the background, you see the newly found most appropriate name for this purpose, Natasha Zuda Happelman. And um, yeah, visualized by Marzia Pachlevan, uh, a graphic designer whom we work with throughout the whole process. And probably you recognize the, the letters and, the, and um, the way how the letters are put. You probably know um, how uh, numbers, codes are kind of hidden by overwriting it through various uh, other letters. So this kind of visibility and invisibility, the presentation within the context of the biennial um, and, uh, and the fact that the artistic position remains invisible for the whole project um, were kind of the, the, the aim and the game that we wanted to um, propose. Oh, so now I need to find, how can I move these slides? Okay, here another uh, image of the press conference and the artistic position herself. At the same time, we published the first images because our idea was to um, argue that the artistic presentation does not only take place during the seven months of the biennial, but that the whole process is part of the artistic work and that artistic work is always, uh, you know, uh, uh, embedded in processes where many people are involved. Um, so um, together with the press conference, or at the day of the press conference, we published the first images that uh, show um, Natasha Zuda Happelman walking and, and, um, and wandering in different landscapes. Here you see her in the south of Germany, um, here as well. And what she did, she um, visited um, places and he tried to she tried to witness places and situations that would be very important for the further project, namely um, gated sites, um, uh, former military caserns and barracks uh, that are now used um, as reception centers for asylum seekers, um, and um, to try to testimony that these sites exist within the borders and on the territories of the Germany and uh, within the borders and on the territory of Europe. Um, so the question was how, um, how um, migration politics and asylum politics as put forward by um, the European community create uh, territories, moments and situations that are um, outside of the otherwise uh, existing law that define people who migrate, who wish to come to Europe and to live in Europe, to define people as uh, criminals, as outlaws, as not yet admitted, and to talk about these conditions, situations, and territories within the framework of the biennial. Here you see uh, Zuda Happelman sitting in front of a court. Um, one, of the, um, one of the reasons I, I um, wish to work together with uh, this particular artist uh, for the Venice Biennial was that um, uh, not only that she migrates between different forms of expressions and that she uses different media such as sounds, installation, or text in her work, but also that she often collaborate with others and, and most importantly, that her work um, aims to uh, move outside the, you know, like the artistic context and to, um, to introduce methods of artistic research or um, performance 
or um, or representation um, in in the context of uh, lawmaking, in the context of legislation. <clears throat> so uh, she also works as an activist, uh, as a teacher, um, as a collaborator in various uh, culture and subcultural scenes. And um, one part of her activities is um, <clears throat> the observation of legal processes where uh, migrants are um, um, <clears throat> are treated and and um, and spoken about in court uh, with the effect that they might or might not uh, be allowed to stay uh, in Germany or in Europe. Here another uh, image for you to uh, understand the context of um, the artistic position and her spokeswoman, Helene Duldung. And Helene Duldung, such um, just as the name of the artist uh, herself is uh, a is a is a fictitious name, a name created for this purpose. Helene Duldung stands for maybe um, a well-educated. Um, um, uh, middle class person um, that uh, cannot be uh, kind of accused of anything, kind of an innocent person. Duldung in German uh, stands for toleration, to tolerate uh, something or someone, but it's at the same time uh, a status that is assigned to asylum seekers and it's actually the weakest um, status one can have. Uh, it goes along with a red bar through the documents of asylum seekers or passports, if they have any, and um, kind of declares that they might be uh, expelled out of um, Europe at any time. Police um, um, police comes and, and gets them. So behind this very harmless or apparently harmless name, there is uh, a whole... Um, array of structure and institutional violence against uh, people who address these urgencies and out of a wish for another, maybe a more um, livable life. Now, why, um, why we came up with um, this idea has many different reasons, but uh, I guess one of the most important reasons is the context and um, the space itself where we were invited to work. And here you see an image of the German pavilion uh, that is located in the Venice Biennale's um, um, Giardini, the, the main site, let's say, where around 30 uh, countries present artistic work. And this building uh, was originally erected in um, 1909, but then uh, reconstructed and, and reshaped in 1938 um, during the Nazi era uh, by an architect called Ernst Heiger, who was also commissioned by Adolf Hitler to uh, make the plans for the new uh, for for the new Berlin, for for the new uh, head or or center of um, the Nazi Empire. So this is the building we were asked to um, to work in, and uh, from the very beginning, we defined this building as a ruin, as um, not only a ruin but a ruinous ruin that would continuously uh, cause harm because of the delimitation, the confinement that it stands for, uh, because of the politics it's, um, it stands for, and because of um, um, the context of asylum politics, current asylum politics that I tried to briefly explicate. So um, those of you who've been to Venice Biennial know that uh, the place, is a very crowded place during the biennial. Um, you have around 600,000, 1 million visitors during the seven months of the biennial. So um, in, in our case, um, more or less um, two to 5,000 people entered the space every day. And um, 
while you would usually enter the space to the front door, which you see here in the picture, we decided to keep this door closed, as we said, um, or as we defined the pavilion as a ruin. So here is a, here is a layout of the buildings, so you can understand the main entrance would be through uh, this door. And we decided instead to use these um, uh, side doors uh, as entrance or, uh, or exit uh, spaces or, um, so in a way to, to shift the front to the back side of the building and to turn the back um, of the building to the front. Okay, I will move a bit faster so I don't occupy so much time. The second uh, journey of Süda Happelmann led her to Foggia in the south of Italy, in Apulia, uh, a place where a lot of uh, asylum seekers who do not receive a per permit to stay in, in other European countries um, end up again, so in the very south of Europe. And this has to do with the regulation um, that is called the Dublin a treaty or the Dublin Agreement that says um, asylum seekers can apply for asylum only in the land, in the country where they first touched European soil. So most probably it would be the southern countries. This is the reason why we see a lot of new walls and, and fences in the south of Europe. And in the case of Italy, it is the Mediterranean Sea uh, that has become a graveyard over the last years and that is kind of ignored and and blanked out by this um, um, by this asylum politics that I was uh, describing. So people who do not get a permit to stay in, in other European countries uh, move towards south or are expelled or sent towards south and find themselves working on plantations in slave-like conditions um, without any legal rights, any human rights, uh, without property, without privacy. And where we stand here and look at here together with Suda Happelmann is uh, a crossroads where a um, very heavy accident took place in which um, goods like agricultural goods, tomatoes um, were transported in one van and the workers in another van. And these two vehicles col um, collided so that uh, the people in the van were uh, crushed and killed by the products that they just have picked and uh, that um, they were literally killed by the labor they are forced into. Um, through this migration politics. And again, the question is like, how can we testimony something? How can we talk about something that, um, uh, that we all know about, that is even supported by a, a legal structure that is illegal in, if we look at it from the point of view of human rights, that, uh, European countries, but many countries in the world agreed upon. So like, how can we, how can we make things visible that are openly uh, occurring uh, in front of our eyes? As I told you, um, <clears throat> Suda Happelmann appeared with the stone mask on her head. And I mean, we could obviously talk about it also in terms of an artistic gesture and from its aesthetic and former aesthetic um, um, implications. But I just wanted to uh, give you an idea how we worked in Venice. So here you see Suda Happelmann together with her spokeswoman, uh, Helene Duldung, um, who are about to deliver a speech at the irregular opening ceremony. Um, again, we try to kind of follow the, the protocol of such events, um, just as with the press conference, but we uh, did this small shift to it. So what you 
could experience is uh, was the artist present, mute, and the spokeswoman who um, who read a different text among others, also quotes from Rosa Luxemburg on her ideas of primitive accumulation that I will briefly talk about. But um, she also uh, quoted uh, um, statements from a Gambian um, re refugee committee in order to speak through the voice of those who already speak but who are not given uh, uh, a voice or who are not heard um, in um, in the main part of the time or in the media or in public awareness. There is a lot of talk about refugees. There, is, uh, there has been a lot of talk of the so-called refugee crisis without uh, talking about whose crisis that would be. So the idea was to, um, to go straight forward and to, to name uh, uh, to wrong the wrong and um, to wrong the wrong through uh, quotes that are 100 years old and also to, uh, to point to the fact that history is uh, not so much about the past but about continuities that continue to haunt uh, the present and that might also determine futures. So it was a very important aspect also to, um, to work in this historically very loaded uh, building, but to, um, uh, to, to remember again and again that these histories uh, are not, um, uh, did not cease yet, so that these histories continue <clears throat> to impact our present. A couple of days later, there was the regular, the official ceremony, opening ceremony, and here you see the German foreign minister, who is the commissioner of the project, together with the artist and the spokeswoman. And um, you see, it's a kind of a difficult uh, situation where there has been talk. I mean, the spokeswoman talked to the foreign minister, but um, there was no communication. Uh, no conversation between the minister and the artist. And this was another uh, question that seemed very interesting and intriguing to us, you know, like how can it be that we pretend there is, um, there is movement and there is exchange between realms of artistic production and political production when there is not. So, um, yeah, by um, these situations, it was very easy to highlight um, this and to, to tackle on these yeah, contradictions, maybe. Okay, so let me continue. Uh, here, a more recent image of the pavilion, and I wanted to show you that... Oh, sorry. Um, oh, no, I lost my cursor, sorry. I wanted to show you that there are moments like here in the Archite Architecture Biennial in 2016 um, where uh, architects uh, proposed the project New Homeland, uh, also a project about migration. Um, and in this case, they decided to deal completely different with the building. They opened the door, as you see in the back part of the building, they even opened the wall so that you had a view on the sea. They opened the building on the side. So they tried to promote an, an image of Germany or the German state as an open and welcoming space. Um, as you can understand, it's a completely different and opposite approach to it. But um, still very interesting. What I'm trying to point out here is that um, all projects uh, deal differently. Um, so here the main entrance, as I said, is closed. In our case, we have two entrances or exits. And as you can see, the installation within the uh, building took on the form of the building. So the Nazis designed a pseudo-sacra um, um, building with an abscess in, in the end. And the form that we built in, and I will briefly um, show you shortly, kind of repeated this, 
this curve. And Natasha often talked about this form as a sad smiley inscribed into this ruinous ruin. Okay, but let's step inside the building. What we did is we left the traces of the architecture biennial that took place one year earlier. So here you see um, the drillings in the wall where they would put cables into the wall because we tried to um, highlight this continuity of structures and infrastructures that promote and and um, prolong um, certain uh, relations of power, of visibility. And I mean, in the ideal case or the normal case, uh, in brackets, one would um, reconstruct the building after the presentation of the architects, paint the walls white and um, remove all the traces of things that have had been in the building before. This we didn't want to do. And um, yeah, in um, in reading um, in in reading different texts, among others, um, among among others, um, Web Du Bois um, um, essays and 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 writings uh, about the tumult laws that would prohibit um, uh, black populations in the U.S. to together, we um, we propose different. Um, uh, different elements in this uh, pavilion, such as uh, this um, study group, this gathering of stones that were, were made for the presentation. So it's uh, stones made out of concrete um, that seem to sit around a pound that is uh, dried out. And what you see in this pound is only the remains of different materials, maybe aluminium, maybe. Um, uh, maybe copper. So um, the presentation was about, or or these images were about how we look at sites, at landscapes that um, humans have shaped and damaged uh, very violently, and what is there to be studied still. In the next room, um, there was this huge construction I briefly showed you, also with stones lying around. So now you see this huge wall, this curved wall that, um, um, that was inspired by uh, the form of dams, water dams that, um, that would be built to contain water, to accumulate water in order to produce energy. And this um, landscape of accumulation, as it's called, is of course a landscape that is ruinous. Uh, we know uh, many examples of dams that, that um, have crawled down, that have devastated landscapes. Um, I will just continue because I have the slight feeling that the time is short. Could you indicate how many minutes, June? Eight? No. Three? Four? Sorry, less less than that. <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe, maybe maybe try and wrap up a little, but uh, okay. in, the, in the next I don't know three minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, here you see the images of um, of uh, the installation in the building. Um, we decided not to use light, so the light would change with the seasons, uh, with the light outside. And as I said, there were two doors. So um, it was also very interesting in terms of sound that came in from outside. Here you see the crates that would be used for the transportation of tomatoes and a fake advertisement for ultra resistant new sorts of tomatoes. Um, yeah, uh, hopefully um, you will understand this uh, in relation to what I said earlier. I wanted to come to the, to the main element uh, in the pavilion, tribute to the whistle, uh, a sound composition uh, that has been developed together with six composers and musicians who had, um, who had eight speakers each. So here on the vertical, you would see one composition. Others decided to 
uh, install their speakers more in form of hubs. And you see in this image in the background, the back side of the dam that I, so, um, uh, I showed you. So it wasn't cl entirely clear in the space whether this construction with the loudspeakers holds the dam or, uh, or vice versa. Um, anyhow, as I told you, we were interested in the, the effects that confinement between human, non-human, between, um, between um, or amongst humans or between humans and nature do. So these effects, these harmful effects. And um, with the composition, we created something that, uh, that you cannot confine. So the sound traveled through the whole space. Here you see another depiction and went to all parts of the space. And tribute to Whistle because um, of one text by Web Dubois who talked about the whistle in the voice, or no, Fred Moten talks about Web Dubois' whistle in the voice as a form of resistance, as a form of, um, of political agency that cannot be halted. And a tribute to whistle because uh, the whistle, this very small instrument, has become a, a, a very meaningful and powerful weapon in the fight of um, refugees to uh, create attention for this situation when, for example, police comes at night and tries to pick individuals from uh, the reception centers. So. Um, I'm coming to the last slides, and obviously it is a very short time to outline all of this, but um, I hope you got an understanding why we decided to uh, take on this commission to work for the German pavilion, but to address these um, precise issues and to try to create uh, resonances far beyond the space of the pavilion and actually we are lucky enough to continue with the work to present the work and i'm very happy that you invited me to do so um, in the framework of um, singapore biennial so thank you so much i will stop here <laughs> thank you francisca uh, that was um, fantastic um, and so we've been trying to sort out the connection and I think we have Miu back online. So Miu, please, if you could um, continue or actually restart, because I think we might not have caught the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks again. Sorry for the glitch. Um, we had uh, slightly disrupted here and now, I guess. And now we can uh, move back to the slide, please. Yeah, so I said, um, I'm going to speak about uh, Eurasia today and the different uh, approaches to it. Uh, so specifically, we'll be mapping the geopolitical discourses around Eurasia, but at the same time, trying to also unmap it um, from below. And that would um, answer to the theme of geopolitics. How do we move from geopolitics to geopoetics? Uh, we're looking at um, the poster of an exhibition that Bina Choi and myself curated that took place in Vladivostok in Russia Far East, um, in which on the poster you see uh, two maps of, of Northeast Asia collaged together. Uh, you see the Russian map uh, originally produced in the 1860s in the lower left, and the Chinese continuation of it on the upper right, which uh, really extends far into Russian territories. So the, the, the peninsula you see is actually the Sahalin. And the question is, why do we have a Chinese map of this Russian territory? Uh, it turned out, after some research, um, it was, um, the map was compelled by a Chinese diplomat uh, who was commissioned in the 1890s to make a Sino-Russian border map. But there was no modern cartography in China at the time, so this diplomat merely transliterated the Russian maps. And by doing that, he also reproduced the border as the Russians uh, perceived it. And he was prosecuted because of these wrongly represented borders, and he soon died because of it. So here we have an instance of um, borders um, as, as, 
as they're born of the struggle and negotiation between theoretically equal modern nation states, replacing what was these frontier zones that are usually uh, used to describe this vastly overlapping um, territories between two empires in pre-modern time. And from this moment on, we see the transition from frontier, from frontier zone to an area with highly militarized borders that is between Russia, China, Korea today, uh, that makes up uh, the geographical composition of uh, Northeast Asia. Now, next. We want to claim that uh, there can be one, but also many, uh, Northeast Asia's. So here we're looking at legal and illegal flows of objects that cross the borders in, in the Russian Northeast. Uh, next. And we're also looking at the conflation of the cosmological and social practices of shamanism that re-emerged uh, in various parts of um, uh, Northeast Asia in Russia, in Korea, in Japan, and in China. Here is the work of uh, Tuo Wang, who looks at um, what he calls the pan-shamanization of the society, of the contemporary society. And we also looked at how the cosmological um, uh, dimensions are embodied in architectural forms of uh, habitation in Northeast Asia. So this is all part of a long-term project that Bina and myself are co-steering called Unmapping Eurasia. Eurasia is a concept that has moved beyond a geographical space and has been captured in various political discourses. Uh, next, please. So here we see um, the concept of uh, Eurasianism, which started in the 1920s already in Russia as a theory that claimed full cultural relativism, that is opacities and differences of cultures in different geo-cultural spaces, each having its unique characters and should develop its own path to modernity, as opposed to following the steps of the West, which was deemed European cultural hegemony of the time. So one of the geocultural spaces was Russia Eurasia, the supranational geoculture united under the self-identification of the Russia with its Eastern traits. Uh, but 80 or uh, 100 years later, we have a uh, resurfacing of this Eurasianism uh, spearheaded by uh, a political strategist called Alexander Dugin. Uh, we can move to the next slide who is a philosopher, a tra trained in Heidegger, but also in Karl Schmitt. Dugin supports um, a party called the Eurasia Party, uh, and it's also a political movement since, since the 2000s already that borrows intellectual resources of Eurasianism in fashioning an anti-American, yet in effect neo-imperial Russian political movement. So Dugin's Eurasianism celebrates Russia's expansionist agenda into uh, uh, Ukraine and, and Georgia uh, in essentially rebuilding a Eurasian sphere of influence. And he's using, and there's a lot of, a lot of political uh, meditations, uh, philosophical meditations around that, uh, using the ocean and continent as a metaphor to describe a continental regrounding associated with Eurasia and to condemn Li, uh, li, uh, liberal intellectuals for following the water, that is the Pacific, and looking west. Now, next. At an earlier point, we had the Japanese Empire and Manchukuo. This is a work that I commissioned uh, a few years back, uh, and I worked on with artist Royce Ng, which depicts the, um, the history and the afterlife of Manchukuo, the Japanese uh, uh, de facto Japanese colony from the 30s to the 40s. Um, the artists wore a kimono uh, that were produced in the late 30s, uh, the so-called propaganda kimono that bear a lot of war motifs. And in this particular kimono, it bore the, um, the, the map of uh, Manchukuo and Korea, the Japanese colony of the time. Um, so if we move to the next, the Japanese um, colonial enterprise was carried out uh, in the beginning with uh, the South Manch Manchurian Railway Company, 
Um, so they took part of the, uh, the Russian railway system uh, and used that as a, as, a, as a starting point to infiltrate political influence into the region. Uh, at the peak of it, uh, this is a map that depicted what they call the Eurasian connections. And you can really see that the, the Japanese railway system could theoretically connect uh, Japan through Korea, which was already a Japanese colony, uh, through the Russian Trans-Siberian uh, railway networks all the way to Europe. Um, this was made in the 30s. Uh, in the next slide, you can see also um, railway connections that goes all the way to Southeast Asia. So this is a map that's tilted 90 degrees and, 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 and basically on the upper left, you see the whole, uh, a little bit of a squeezed uh, Indonesia and then the Malaya world and then Taiwan being this big island in the middle. Now, the next slide. Um, that coincided, of course, um, at the peak of um, the territory at the peak of uh, the uh, 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 influence before or during the Pacific Wars. So all of this Japanese expansion uh, before and during the Second World War were um, justified theoretically by uh, actually decolonization of Southeast Asia from the European colonizers. Uh, and another philo more philosophical um, grounding for that is uh, uh, Great Asianism and the so-called Great East Asian Co-Prosperity Circle. And here again, we have Kyoto school thinkers, some of them trained also uh, with Heidegger, who claim um, a, a, um, a multinational, multi-ethnic, uh, multi multilinguistic kind of unity of, uh, of uh, Asian peoples uh, guided by the Japanese that uh, is supposed to lead to Asia's mo modern project. So in the next slide, uh, you see on the left, um, a, uh, some, of the uh, some of the stamps I collected uh, from Manchu Guo. This was produced in uh, uh, 1942. That um, basically uh, show you this happy uh, ethnic women uh, uh, holding hands together. Uh, under Manchu Guo. So we um, recently, I, I, I think the Singaporean artist Ho Zunian has been digging up uh, these wartime um, conferences that were held between the Kyoto school thinkers and the Japanese wartime cabinet. And uh, in looking at this extremely dark uh, but also philosophically rich, uh, and which is why that is so tormenting part of the history. Now, next, we will jump to another uh, more contemporary uh, moment, which is the Chinese government-led supranational uh, infrastructure project called the Belt and Road Initiative, which um, is trying to promote and facilitate regional multilateral cooperation, although for most of it, uh, you actually only see bilateral contracts between China and the respective countries. To date, the initiative has expanded to around 70 countries in Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Europe, and Oceania, incorporating one third of the world's GDP and one quarter of global foreign investment flows. And there are uh, concerns over that trap uh, for example, we saw in the case of Sri Lanka when the government failed to repay the debt that the China uh, Chinese government uh, lent to it in in 2015. It was uh, it sold a 99 year lease to um, to China to the Chinese merchant ports holding, granting rights to the uh, Habantota port for 99 years. Uh, the next slide, please. The, um, the cultural discourse around uh, BRI or Belt and Road Initiative is, of course, um, it's the new Silk Road, it's the new um, uh, uh, global, global connection that uh, uh, very much in the, in the image of the old Silk Roads. 
Um, so one figure that comes up constantly is uh, Zheng He, the Chinese uh, admiral who sailed through Southeast Asia uh, to Africa, but also to Mecca because he was a Muslim in the 15th century. And he's always depicted as this um, person who embodied this peaceful pre-modern globalization spirit. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Zheng He's uh, uh, expeditions or journeys were peaceful in most part, but it, he did actually kidnap, um, they did kidnap the Sri Lanka king on the way. Um, and uh, we're working with, this is in the context of the Shanghai Biennale, we're working with a Singaporean artist, Chu Haopei, who has been um, working to trace the, 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 the legacies and the afterlives of uh, Zheng He in Southeast Asia. So he's been traveling through uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand to look at how Zheng He has been deified and, and, and mystified, uh, both by the Muslim community, but also the Chinese community. There's even a Filipino TV drama made on, on Zheng He. Uh, so to create, uh, in his words, a non-aligned approach to the legacy of Zheng He. So you see that uh, Eurasia or the Silk Road or Asianism, all of this has been, uh, has been very grandiose uh, uh, discourses with really um, complex political intentions. And our question is, how can we rescue Eurasia from these uh, discourses? Let's move to the next slide. Mm. This is another take on Eurasia. This is Eurasia without uh, the national borders and the geocultural spaces mm. and the, the railways, where the only infrastructure you see is, of course, the, the natural um, uh, geography and the geology of it being uh, the steppes, the, the rivers that connected many parts of Eurasia, the mountains. So one way of approaching that, uh, if we kind of move, can move on to the more uh, sensible uh, uh, forms, is uh, to start with the, the body of Eurasia as it is. Next slide, please. So we've worked, for example, with artists who try to understand um, the formation of uh, mountains and of geology in Eurasia in choreographing using a score of, um, of uh, Eurasian geotectonics. This is Lucy Tuma, who made a one-hour performance based on the, geo, the, the geotectonic kind of uh, movements of Eurasia. And uh, in, in, in working with such artists, we're trying to explore um, what does it mean to form one body with the planet itself. This is a, 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 a cue that we took from the French uh, anarchist geographer who was working a lot in um, Central Asia at the end of the 19th century, who uh, formulated this beautiful concept of the, silk, the slow Silk Road and how the Silk Road should um, enable us to understand our place in the world and in forming one body with the planet itself. Next slide, please. We also have such maps of Eurasia that depict the, um, the decentralized networks of Eurasia. Uh, next slide. And we're, of course, thinking um, with artists and cultural practitioners like uh, Nanjun Paik, who declared uh, this Eurasian uh, 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 network to be a pre-modern information highway. And here is a very cryptic dialogue uh, between Nanjun Paik and Yusuf Boyce, uh, both meditating on Eurasia and both maybe fantasizing a little bit what it might be. Next slide. We're also looking at Transformation stories uh, coming from Eurasia. This is a curious uh, piece of painting we found in, uh, in Vladivostok, a modernist painting, but borrowing traditional motifs. And the interesting uh, feature of it is that it depicted um, 
uh, deers and, and whales on the same image. Deers are, of course, uh, a common motif in uh, petroglyphs throughout Central Asia, Siberia, all the way into uh, Eastern Europe, uh, because they were believed to be uh, a medium between the human realm and, 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 and the above realm uh, due to the shape of the antlers. Uh, whales is, are the only anti-modern animal that decided to go back to the sea. Uh, well, it has already uh, uh, f have fully evolved to live um, on land. And the curious aspect of the, being the whale and the deer depicted together is that we actually have a few sources, both from Korea and from uh, Chinese Taoist stories, that uh, attest to the transformation between the deer and the whale, or the deer and the shark. So there are various ways of explaining it. Uh, I will not go into this uh, extremely kind of uh, 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 nerdy uh, details on how that happens. Uh, but uh, the upshot of it is that the, the function, um, we should actually reconsider myth and uh, the stories that we have. Um, uh, because in the very beginning, at the, at the dawn of the humanities, we only have uh, Earth stories. We have stories where humans are sort of observants in all and in service vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, the world around us. And then slowly we started only focusing on human stories, moral stories, and only recently with um, Gaia, uh, Bruno Latour, and all these uh, uh, questions of back to Earth, do we have a resurgence of this sort of Earth stories? Um, so the question here is how do we learn from those myths, not to take them just as speculative stories, but to also use them to help us reposition ourselves in the world. And in that spirit, um, I'll continue with a couple of other examples. Uh, next slide, please. These are um, family tokens from Udmortia. It's a community of Fino Ugric speaking, language speaking uh, community west of the Ural Mountains. Uh, it's a sign of property and possession. Uh, let's move to the next slide. And people are still uh, practicing that. Next slide, please. Um, so it's a sign of possession which you can carve uh, onto the woods that you see, but uh, it also worked as a as a as a um, it essentially worked as a money uh, intermediary because when you have it carved onto animals, fabrics, carpets, uh, and, uh, other objects, you can exchange these objects, and this works as a as a as a as a leisure for the exchange. But there's also something else that, uh, that, ha that happens with such exchanges because um, the family tokens facilitate not just the exchange uh, as a kind of money media intermediary or as a unit, uh, unitary uh, 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 measurement of value, but also it transfers sensations, histories, and stories of, around families. And if you think about this practice of carving these family tokens onto the woods, uh, given this abundance of trees in the Siberian taiga, uh, there's uh, practically an infinite amount of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, relationships that you can establish. And this is not a claim over uh, nature, but rather a custodianship uh, in, 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 in common with nature. And uh, the last two examples, I'll, I'll briefly go through. Next, please. Are uh, the star atlas uh, found in Dunhuang from the 700s uh, in, in, the, in the common era? And next. The petroglyphs that you'll find uh, 5,000 kilometers away in the southern event. Um, so both are star atlases um, that uh, qualifies uh, as a, as a, as a pre-modern, very scientific kind of measurement of, uh, of our understanding of astrology, 
but at the same time it's also imbued with the search for astrological omens and cosmological righteousness and especially in the second case uh, in the uh, Levant uh, desert uh, when the nomads moved uh, there was a kind of triple movement there is the movement of the nomads there is the movement of the stars and then the third movement that uh, communicates in between the nomads and, and, and heaven. So with all of these kind of mm, maps uh, or unmaps, uh, there's a commons that's shared between the mover and the space and not, again, this modern objectivity imposed over space. So let's move to the last two slides. We are inspired by all of these Eurasian stories these ethics, uh, models of relating to the world, ethics of moving, uh, a different kind of sociality. And what we try to articulate out of that, uh, out of this, uh, back into the uh, experience of, a, of a, or a, a practice of art is, uh, for example, shown here. So this is our students from the Dutch Art Institute um, after a one year study program we uh, decided to collectively embody the Eurasian underground library and um, actually were supposed to show uh, part of it at the Singapore Biennale, <laughs> if not for the coronavirus. Um, so Eurasia is not this, um, uh, we did all this mapping of these political claims over Eurasia, but we also felt that Eurasia can only be enacted by the librarians themselves through their storytelling, through encounters, uh, and, and through works of art that, that, that keep growing and make up this growing library. So here uh, you see the mats, this, the nomadic mats that we designed, which is very versatile. You can use it to cover yourself uh, when there's rain, you can use, use it to sit onto it. And then if you wrap it around, you can actually create these ropes uh, which you see in the center. And the last slide, please. So one moment that we enacted um, in a public presentation last year was that we in in invited um, everyone to tie their uh, ropes together to create this collective uh, tug of war game. So not a binary uh, kind of combative sport, but a decentralized uh, collective tug of war where everybody has to pay attention and be very uh, mindful for the collectivity so that uh, you and the collectivity does not fall out. And while the, um, this collective tug of war game was enacted, our librarians told short stories uh, on Eurasia, on the Mies. Um, so that is uh, perhaps a more poetic way or geopoetic way to end this presentation on Eurasia. Hi, all right, thank you, Minyo. Um, and now we're going to move on to Bart. Are you ready? <laughs> Um, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, all of you, and good morning. And um, if you're in New York, good night. Um, my presentation will be a, a bit complementary to that of uh, Miu. Um, two months ago, I was invited uh, to contribute to Festschrift. The person inviting me, specifying that the topic expected was the present research of the contributors. So she thought I was doing research. And that gave me the courage to look into some things I've been wanting to look into for a long time when being invited for this session on geopoetics. It was clear to me, or it seemed clear to me, that geopoetics in this context was shorthand for Eurasia, because that's what the Singapore National Gallery and us have been speaking about for a long time. Uh, so that there's this undercover word, certainly also because Miu was invited, for whom this is uh, the main focus of, uh, of research. Uh, we have been calling uh, Muka for quite some time now a Eurasian Museum, 
which for us was, um, among others, a ploy to address the catatonic state of fear this part of Eurasia has been into. Since Europe, very belatedly at the end of the 80s, discovered it was not the center of the world anymore. And like the horizon of hope after the Second World War was oriented to the West, the horizon of fear was oriented to the East. So perhaps our, our main move has been to simply state that Eurasia is the largest island in the world. That might give us the desire to speak with other people in other corners of the island. It might reverse things. Uh, we are aware of the complexity of the notion that Miu has invoked, and therefore we have based ourselves on some reference artists like Joseph Boyce, the counterpart of Namjoon Pike, who has done uh, his famous performance Eurasian Stab in Antwerp, uh, or like Jimmy Durham, who has used it in both dynamic and uh, Eurocritical uh, fashion, making us aware that we are mainly peninsula of a larger reality. The limit of the notion seems to me in the very space of freedom it allows. We may enact our desires in it, while the rest of the world goes on with business as usual. What may be an ethics of geopoetics? It seems to me that we should aim to let our thinking aspire that it effectively affects the organization of our world. Eurasia then, I think, should not only be lofty and floating, but also grounded in the operational pragmatics of the question of how we may live together. We do not do so well today, I think, all of us. Impasse seems to be our preferred construct, allowing negative energies to rest against the divide. A secure way to structure the situations on both sides of it and much easier than the complex, fragile, even irresolvable cultivation of an ever agonistic togetherness. One of today's versions of impasse is a standoff between an essentialist cosmopolitanism that only enjoys mixed culture and that uh, appeals to both neoliberal and progressive network ideologies, and on the other hand, neo-nationalisms that want to find back coherent localization with defined territory enchanting those who crave to regain a sense of being part of something. Perhaps there is no final solution. Perhaps we should not only focus on the macro level of reflection, on the micro level of lived experience, but also on the meso level of negotiations between those two. There, we might discover modes and constructs that may improve our capacity of being together. So in a certain way, I, I take also on that level um, um, a complementary perspective to me you in the sense that uh, I, I don't only I don't wonder how geopolitics may steer away steer away from geopolitics but whether we might not in some way include them take them back what are transnational realities in Eurasia at this moment on the one hand there's the both highly effective and completely dysfunctional European community on the other hand there is the Belt and Road initiative me you has been mentioning both start with lofty rhetorics about diversity. The Europe of diversity of Jacques Delors, the Silk Route notion of China, that end up in sheer economic organization. Are there other examples that may inform us? There, for some time now, I wondered whether we should not venture into a taboo area of our thinking. The most evil notion of all, empire. To look whether the pragmatic solutions certain empires have developed might help us open up flight lines. As a Belgian, coming from a country that has been occupied by both the Austrians, the Dutch, the French, the Germans, and the Spanish, not to mention the Anglo Saxons, I might get away with that, I thought. Now, the most interesting spaces for that might be what I call cultural empires as opposed to trade empires that are mostly about managing extraction, such as the British or other colonial uh, European empires, also like the weird Belgian Congo one. As cultural empires, I see those transnational constructs that have to piece themselves together as one body. For my corner of the world, I then see the Austro-Hungarian, the Ottoman and the Russian Empire, 
that were all part of the negotiation of the border area between Europe and Asia, battling one another over there. They are all clearly problematic, obviously, but they may be more interestingly problematic than the traditional nation states uh, we still take for granted as a kind of default mode of our uh, function. I might even argue that those traditional nation states have all the vices of empire. The development and continuation of top-down power relations, the expansionism, successful casting of a homogenizing story, without the factual qualities those have in somehow dealing with diversity. These three empires simply had to do so. The core group being a minority within its accumulated territory. So that this was the only way to stay in the driver's seat. They were combining centralization with the nature of a cadaveric ski. They aimed to unify the structure, but diversity was bound to and could continue to exist under that. The complex internal structure of present-day Russia still um, it testifies it. Muka has engaged, among others, for ethno-futurism from the Finno-Ugric Republic of Marielle, for the work of Evgeny Antufiev, originating from Tuva, and for that of Tars Makacheva, originating from Dagestan, all Russia. Austria Hungary saw itself as a patchwork of kingdoms and territories. The dual structure after the compromise of 1867 was based on a small river, the Leita, the historic border between Austria and Hungary. And the outcome of the compromise distinguished between Transletania with Hungary and Croatia Slavonia on the Adriatic coast and Cisletania, the Austrian part officially named the kingdoms and lands represented in the Imperial Council. Those were 17 countries stretching from Dalmatia, also on the Adriatic coast, to Bukowina, east of Hungary. Besides those, there was a condominium of Bosnia-Herzegovina. The core image was the alma mater Austria, Austria as a mother, protecting and stimulating its people. It's a self-image only, for whatever that's worth, but perhaps it's worth more than nothing. The title of the Ottoman Sultan recited over 40 territories, ending with, and many other countries and cities, still resonating the conquest. Echoing the spoils of war that it initially propelled it, it was a tax revenue empire. As long as it would get those, it didn't care too much. The Ottoman Empire, from the onset, acknowledged the non-Muslim parts of its population and gave them substantial autonomy within their community. This would lead to the Millet system, granting religious groups their own separate legal courts for personal matters and even the possibility to levy taxes. The base was all the same discriminatory, of course. If a Muslim was involved, Sharia law would be applied. And um, the non Muslim population was greatly appreciated because of the higher taxes they paid. The institutionalized diversity of cultures might also have reverse effects. There were printing houses in Istanbul from the 15th century onwards but all initiated by Armenian, Jewish, and Greek communities. They had a knowledge advantage, and the ruling part of the empire acknowledged this advantage. The first Muslim printing house opened only in 1727, and then it needed a fatwa by the Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire, stating that Islam did allow this, and the firma by the Sultan. In Russia, the coherence of statehood was based upon two notions. The, the Tsar on the one hand, the community of the village on the other. The image of the father Tsar, father sovereign, or even affectionately the little father, linked power directly with the specificity to our, of those communities. And the notion of the village was in Russia not only a rhetoric, it might even become a legal system, as I find out when uh, uh, visiting Dagestan. To stabilize the unruly Caucasus, the Russian Empire there implemented three layers of legislation. It used Russian law as far as the empire was involved, Sharia to pacify the Islamic energy it had subjugated, and for local stuff, the local legislation. That was virtually different village per village, so it was codified at that point. 
Depending on the circumstances, a murder might result on e under each of the three. The empire would only get involved and apply its law if need be, namely when one of its civil servants was murdered or a murderer. In a slightly comparable way, the Austro-Hungarian Empire differentiated three different levels of language. The language of command. Besides that, the official language that was used for most official documents. And the language of the regiment. And the last one based itself upon the soldiers. If 20% of them were speaking a certain language, it was accepted as such. It also meant that the officer had to obtain at least a basic knowledge of it. These empires lived diversity. On the shores of the Bosporus, churches, mosques, and synagogues might literally share walls. Cities such as Odessa, Baku, Lviv, Trieste, Jerusalem, or Smyrna were melange realities. Over here in Flanders, we love to think Josef Roth as being linked to the small port city of Ostend, where he started his exile, together with his colleague Stefan Schweig. But if the world remembers him, it is for his evocations and political understanding of the multicultural reality in the world he had to leave. Lviv, Lvov, or Lemberg, he calls a variegated spot with a polyglot splendor of color and a small branch of the big world. He also writes, the city democratizes, simplifies, humanizes, and it seems that this characteristic is connected to its cosmopolitan tendencies. And also, it is a city of the melted borders. What may we learn from these former empires? Having dwelt in their history for a bit of time now, I feel at loss. The ways in which they tolerate the diversity, obviously, actually, aim to accommodate taxation, the functionality of the system, and occupation. There is no such thing as clean systemic power, like there is no such thing as clean money. Keeping them in mind may at best help us to liberate our own thinking. We do have a tendency to take the present political state of affairs for granted. We do not question the framework of nation states we are working in, most often. We most often merely evacuate ourselves from that into lofty cosmopolitanism. Thinking in terms of the related diversity these empires had to work with, we might let the present borders melt in our imagery for more interesting senses of localized diversity and wider relations. That may go into two directions. On the one hand, it may mean going beyond borders, such as we have to do over here in Antwerp. We may see our own political base, Flanders, extended through a multiplicity of overlapping regions and take Eurocore as our real international region, the logistical help of the European community, stretching from the German Rhineland to Dutch Amsterdam and French Lille. Eurocore has been coherent in cultural terms for a long time and continues to do so, as Rem Colas and OMA analyzed. Reversely, we might cease to think of areas such as China or Indonesia as nation states and analyze their internal coherence in a qualified way as we think external coherence elsewhere. Keeping them in mind may also help us to see cultural diversity as a constitutive element of localized identity rather than as an amendment to it. In the desire for outreach, Mirka is earlier on giving special attention to places of exchange such as Shanghai or Singapore. Harbors are by definition a place of contact, exchange and mixture and can embody familiarity and otherness at the same time. We may add to those harbors places like Lviv, where once kaftans and the latest fashion from Paris coexisted, as Joseph Roth noticed, and where that continues to resonate in its sense of self. These cities have the added advantage of a related localization, Lviv being a reference for both Galicia, Poland, and Austria-Hungary. Cities of empire are not perfect as cultural constructs, but neither is the outcome of trade flows in harbors. Likewise, we may then see our favorite harbor cities in a more complex way than the present cosmopolitan fashion of mapping culture and society as an urban phenomenon surrounded by empty, retarded wasteland. The efforts of Singapore to link itself up to Southeast Asia, 
thus get a quality that transcends mere city marketing. Harbors, obviously, relate not themselves with their region to the world. We might also consider looking at particular constructs for dealing with diversity without wanting to turn them into future guidelines, rather looking them at not so bad outcomes and as best cases. And we might develop interesting cases ourselves, consciously using, for example, different languages in different roles or using different sets of agreements in different circumstances. We have allowed too much homogenization by the current empire of globalization. Our main challenge, if we want to think Eurasian, I believe to be the gestalt we project of it. There too, reconsidering these empires may be of some help. They combined an urge for unification with the self-image as a patchwork of linked up differences. At its best moments, enjoying that. What shall we go for together? Pro quilt? How can we think today such a unity in linked and localized diversity? The only base for grand theory that addresses this and that I'm aware of is by the early post-colonial thinker Nikolai Trubetskoy. He initiated in 1921 the notion of Eurasianism, developed by a vast multidisciplinary network of Russian emigrated thinkers after the Russian Civil War. And as Miu has been indicating, there's a long story of abuse of these initial ideas after that, now going to a hilarious uh, other side. Um, what they were searching at that moment was an alternative vision for the space of the Russian Empire, alternative to both the Empire and USSR, as coherent space in between Europe proper and Asia proper. This vision was informed by the Prague linguistic circle Trubetskoy belonged to. And its understanding of language as a system of subsystems that never exist in isolation because they relate in both diachronic and synchronic ways, ways that are interconnected themselves just as well. Now, I think this, this is quite in resonance with what the, the, the way of thinking uh, Cyril Biri has been uh, evoking. In this vein, earlier Eurasianism argued relations between the different cultures in the former empires, not based upon origin, but upon coexistence in the same geographical space for a long time. If we do away with the quest of the early Eurasianists to determine the borders of the space they interqualify, for example, Stubetskoy's Eurasia does not include the Baltics he originated from, he's a prince from the Geminid house, and also part of Siberia is actually sometimes left out. But their vision might now inform the whole of our future Eurasia. In their vein, we may analyze the cultural relationalities all over our island with the melting of borders in order to establish a sense of shared identity grounded in their diversity, both localized and interconnected in a multitude of ways. At least in principle, we do not need borders. Border regions, anyhow, most often have a mutual sense of relatedness surpassing the border. In cultural reality, we don't base ourselves upon borders even if we abide upon them all too often. We do need, however, coherent cultural spaces to areas that develop their own sense of gravity by sharing words, media, opinions, and visions as an outcome of their diversity and discussions, because agonism is the base for the mutual understanding, even in the tiniest village. Shouldn't be in a city, also in a village. Chantal Mouffe, who has earlier been referred to and who coined the word agonism, recently, last week, me, you, you were there, uh, evoked in Brussels um, 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 a notion that of external agonism complementary to this internal agonism. In order to depict her vision of a pluriversal world, um, she speaks about divergent variations which she takes from the Écart Différentiel, Claude Lévi-Strauss, so between cultures, more than mere difference. It validates substantial distinction and power relations. This unavoidable and fertile tension we can cultivate only in the same way we do within our local space of gravity, the areas we tend to form into regions and countries. We can speak together because we trust we can. 
This feeling of trust we can enhance, obviously, through modes of behavior. For example, not diabolizing one another. And by finding ways to listen to divergent needs and value divergent ways of speaking. And the most effective base of that is obviously the simple sense of familiarity and proximity. And this is what the Prague's circle language analysis rightfully discerned. A sense of proximity mean, means a shared context, shared experiences, and in due time, a shared sense of language. Because people who live together speak together. And therefore, people who speak together, they live together. Early Eurasianism tried to understand this kind of relatedness in multi-layered ways, both diachronic and synchronic, pertaining to religion, cultural expressions, geography. Its approach offers a possibility to think a large space in terms of divergences and relationality at the same time. This may let us become aware, more aware, of a fabric of relational capacities to work with, urgent or other potential, stronger or weaker. The link of Antwerp to Singapore, for example, is obviously weaker than the to Berlin, but as a harbor city, Antwerp may focus on the first one all the same. In such a fabric of relations, the cultural diversity in its cities does not make them the connecting place, and there with French, or of harbor city thinking, nor the place of capital decision making, cosmopolitanism holds them to be. Cities, on nodes and relational networks, an actual network system on their own behalf, in the specific region of which they are part, a patch of our island. We had originally had some time for a uh, discussion, uh, but uh, the live discussion also was going to involve the Zoom uh, application, and I think which is new to us, uh, and I think also to our viewers. So uh, there was the possibility for you to. Uh, ask questions via the um, platform, but uh, no one has. I think we didn't figure that part out yet. But in any case, we've kind of run out of time. And uh, we do want to acknowledge, though, that we did receive a question um, by email, and which was on the subject of collaborations and how collaborators um, might be acknowledged um, and credited in the work of um, art and artists who are then um, working to represent or to um, uh, collaborate with communities. Um, unfortunately, we <coughs> might not be able to um, have answered this question at this time because we do want to leave um, uh, the next two hours for the second panel of uh, speakers. So um, I hope in any case, uh, we, that might be a conversation that could be had uh, beyond um, the, the um, confines of this panel itself. So I'd like very much to thank all our speakers. I think you would all agree that their presentations were absolutely fantastic. And I just want to take a last word uh, with, um, to draw a, a, a connections between um, all the presentations that we've heard this afternoon, which has been absolutely amazing. I mean, we had begun, um, interestingly, with uh, the kind of dense materiality in the form of um, um, Maloba's um, 1940s sculpture, Death, uh, in Moses's presentation, and then linked somehow to uh, Francisca's um, presentation on the stone mask. And then after that, moving into the subject of borders that started with Francisca's uh, presentation and then brought us through, that kind of continued through in Neos um, on map and maps and unmapping, which then seems to also very naturally and automatically um, segue to um, Bart's uh, presentation uh, where both Miu and Bart were speaking on Eurasia as a connecting force that kind of extends beyond the geopolitical and uh, that needs to be um, more than just rhetorics also, which brings us back round to what Moses was speaking about. And I think perhaps with that, um, we might leave this um, panel with uh, you know, this, this, the sense of these possibilities Right, these possible premonitions of what is to come and whether uh, what is to come is really the return of the whale of the empire. And so with that, uh, I want to thank everyone and our speakers um, for being part of this panel today. Um, I'm told that we actually have an audience of um, up to the thousands. <laughs> so um, that's fantastic and interesting to imagine, right? So um, thank you everyone and uh, I'll uh, well, I think we um, will have to give the time to the second panel.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, June. Thank, thank you. And, and thank you, Bart. And thank you, Francesca. And thank you, Miu. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I was just <laughs> typing. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll speak more soon. Okay.